We've worked hard and made history many times. We've gotten this far because together we are tireless. That doesn't mean we don't get tired. It means we help each other continue on. And knowing one voice is strong, but the power of thousands or millions is stronger. We are the tireless, and together we will achieve gender equality. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Canadian Women's Foundation's live chat with author Eternity Martis. I'm going to see her in a second, but I just wanted to say hello. Thank you for joining us. My name is Andrea Gunraj, and I work with the Canadian Women's Foundation. Um, as you might know about the Canadian Women's Foundation, we're Canada's public foundation for gender equality. We support diverse women, girls, and everybody affected by gender inequality to move out of poverty, out of violence, and into confidence and leadership. This month, of course, we're really focused on the impact of COVID-19 on girls in particular. It's October, it's the month of the International Day of the Girl. And people are talking about gendered impacts, but what about young women and what about girls? The mental health of girls and diverse young women has worsened from what we've seen in the research so far, and the risk of economic instability and violence at home we know has increased in the pandemic. Programs like the ones that the Canadian Women's Foundation supports help girls find belonging, community, and mentorship. But they're struggling to stay open. It's really, it's a hard time, as you know. Um, so we are just trying our best to support girls through a great campaign called Show Up for Girls this October. Every dollar you donate to our Girls Fund will turn into three, thanks to Singing Ship Entertainment, one of our partners and our other partner, Giant Tiger. So you can visit CanadianWomen.org, Show Up for Girls, and you'll be able to give a, a, a donation that turns into three. One dollar turns into three. That's Show Up for Girls. That's the hashtag. And of course, you go to our website, CanadianWomen.org, show up for girls, and you'll be able to donate there. So I just want to give an introduction to Eternity, our guest. Hello, Eternity. Hi, Andrea. How are you? Good. How are you? I am great. <laughs> so Eternity, as you know, is an award-winning Toronto-based journalist and editor whose work has been featured in the Huffington Post, Vice, Chatelaine, McLean's, and many more publications. She specializes in personal journalism, feature and long form writing, and covers race and racial injustice, gender and gender-based violence, health and reproductive rights, relationships and identity politics. Her best-selling memoir, I'm trying to show it on the screen, there you go. Um, it is called, They Said This Would Be Fun, Race, Campus Life and Growing Up. It's featured on many must-read book lists including Now Magazine, The Globe and Mail, Pop Sugar, Blog Tio, CBC, Chatelaine. Um, it's been named one of Indigo's top 50 books of 2020, and it's an Audible and Apple pick for one of the best audiobooks in 2020. And Eternity, it's been fun because I got a chance to read your book on paper, and I got to listen to it in audio, and it was a joy just to hear your voice. So I really encourage you folks, if you get the opportunity to listen to it, you'll enjoy it. And you can buy it anywhere where books are sold. And of course, support your local indie bookstore. We want to make sure that they are well supported nowadays. Um, and you can get it in ebook and audible format as well. So before we get started, I just want to let you know, you know, technology is weird. If we get caught off, if something happens and we disappear, hang tight, we're going to come right back on. Don't click on any sketchy links that you don't recognize. Sometimes people do bad things online and uh, we're not happy about that. Don't do it. And you folks, don't click on it. Just go to CanadianWomen.org. That's, that's the only site that you need to know in this amount of time that we'll be together. Um, so we're going to start off with our first question, Eternity. Where are you and how are you? Well, thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I am in Toronto, where it is hot for the last day uh, of the year, I guess. And um, I'm good. I have been very busy with book stuff. I, I technically am still on a virtual book tour. So very busy and um, very happy to be busy and enjoying my last day of, um, of warm weather. Yeah, you wore shorts today. I did. I wore shorts boldly. Um, I just thought, you know what? It's my last chance. So I wore shorts and I was not cold. <laughs> That's great. 
Um, so, you know, at the foundation, as I mentioned, we're talking a lot about how the pandemic is impacting women and girls and folks who are experiencing gender injustice. Tell us how the pandemic has impacted your day to day life as a writer, as somebody who traffics in words. Well, um, the pandemic has definitely um, created a weird case of writer's block for me. And uh, I didn't think that would happen. I thought, oh, well, like I'm, I myself am, am an introvert. So I thought, well, I'll just do the things that writers do. They kind of hide off away from everyone and write. And it's been the complete opposite um, for many reasons, including good reasons, such as my book tour. But um, there's just something very weird about this pandemic where you're, you're constantly having to think. And if you're not thinking and working or trying to figure out Zoom, um, you're worried about the future. And there's really no time to write. So I haven't been able to write the ways that I want. I've been trying in the last actual, actually um, the last month and getting a few words out here and there, but I'm trying to be kind to myself. I think a few words are better than no words. Um, but as a writer, it always feels nice when you, when you write a couple of words down. So I'm trying to keep that up for the rest of the year. I feel that if you just do like, a paragraph a day, you are a hero. Yes. So yes. Great, great stuff. Um, so I do wonder, um, your book has been recognized on top book lists as we saw, and then I think it was last week you had an announcement that it would be coming to screens. I know that you're not allowed to say too, too much about it, but tell us a little bit what you can tell us about that exciting announcement. Sure. So um, my book was uh, the TV and the film rights were sold at auction um, to Temple Street, uh, which is a division of Boat Rocker. So it's a Canadian and a U.S. company in partnership. So, um, yeah, we're just in very early talks, but um, we're talking mostly about a TV series, could be a film, we're not sure yet. Um, so it's really, really exciting because while I was writing the book, I had always kind of envisioned this the, the visuals of the book, what they would look like. So it's nice to kind of be in this place now where there's so much interest in bringing the book version to the screens. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing the, the the stuff that didn't necessarily fit into the book or the dialogue, um, seeing that in a, in a new format um, when that, whenever that happens. That's really cool. And folks, uh, I see that some comments are coming in Please do add any comments that you have at the end. We're going to ask a, a bit of a QA and and um, hopefully not put you on the spot eternity, but we'll, we'll have some questions. Some people come up with some sure. really excellent questions here. Um, so I want to ask you about this idea of reading or writing as an escape. You had mentioned as a child, you had a relationship with reading or writing that felt like an escape. I want to know what your relationship now feels like. Is it still an escape or is it something else now? Yeah, it's a it's a great question, and um, I'm kind of heartbroken to say that reading and writing at this particular moment is not much of an escape, and um, I had hoped it would be, and uh, I've still bought so many books. I have a ton, you can probably see my bookshelf behind you, but um, I want to escape in books, and one of the, the genres, I'm, I'm not a big fiction person, but I've found that lately I want to escape in fiction, but the act of just picking up the book or even writing, trying to write fiction, I haven't written fiction in 13 years, I'm trying to escape, but I don't have the capacity to do it. So um, in a way, it's not the escape that it used to be for me. Um, growing up, as you know, in the book, I didn't have a lot of friends, I was an only child, so I read a lot, actually. It was Harry Potter books and Mary Kay and Ashley Olsen books that helped me escape and these days I'm looking for that that same type of escape so I'm hoping I can have a quiet moment one of these days to to try and uh, regain my love of reading and writing like I did even a year ago um, I just as you mentioned your background let's just take a look at this background um, your bookshelf looks like it's yeah um, let's let's just take a minute to enjoy the beauty of this <laughs> I, it appears to be well organized. Tell us about this organization system. So I am very neurotic when it comes to my bookshelf. Um, it's color coded and um, I did the whole, you know, it starts big and then goes small. So they're all organized by color. As you can probably see, the last shelf has some work to do. But um, at the top, the very, very top, and if you can see it right there, those are my Harry Potter books. Um, when, you know, when we all loved JK Rowling um, many years ago, but I ha actually have Harry Potter bookends that I've been waiting like 15 years to use. So um, I actually pulled out all the, the shelves in my closet, moved all my clothes to the other room and uh, just to have this, this library of sorts. It is glorious. Eternity, it's like, 
It's like Pinterest in the background there. I'm so impressed. Oh, thank you. Gorgeous. Thank you. I used a lot of Pinterest to figure it out. <laughs> okay. Um, and going on to other matters, uh, very important matters. Actually, your book gets into the weight of racism and sexism in higher learning environments in the academy mm -hmm. and its impact on students' ability to learn and thrive and grow and do all the things that any young person should be able to freely do. Tell us more about how this weight impacts students in your thoughts. Well, I think there are, there are a couple things that students aren't prepared for. When you go to university, you go to have the time of your life. And that's what you think. You're going to, if partying is your thing, you're going to party. You're going to hang it all night. You're fr there's freedom from your parents if you decide to move away from university. And I think what happens is we don't prepare students for, especially students of color, um, for what they can expect. And for me, again, I, I had no idea what to expect. I was the first person in my family to go to a Canadian university. Fun fact, when I moved into residence, I brought all of my stuff. Like I brought every single thing in my room to my residence that I shared my room that I shared with somebody so I hadn't I knew nothing but what I was not expecting was to be um, to be dealing right off the bat with this uh, it started as kind of ignorant racism um, all racism is ignorant but these ignorant comments that were you know um, these seemed kind of funny at the time because I wasn't used to them but uh, you know we have a black girl on the floor and I was the only black woman on the floor um, we, uh, black people are so funny your English is so good you must not be used to the winters because you're not born here and um, I wasn't prepared for that and then when I went to class I definitely wasn't prepared for nobody ever sitting beside me and I talk about this a bit in the book but um, in my classes, I was often the only black person and a class could be entirely full and in the winter, there'd be jackets stuffed in the aisles and nobody would sit beside me. At one point, a girl, she takes her chair from beside me and she shoves it, like she attaches it to like um, a, a full desk. So you're dealing with alienation on all these fronts. Um, then you try and go out at nighttime and alcohol and locals, they don't they don't vibe well. Then you're being called names, you're being called the Edward, you're being called, um, things that you've never heard sometimes um, in your life. And for me, I had never heard those things. So we're not prepared in that sense. And then if you're a woman, um, you're dealing with sexual assault, which is very, very prevalent on campus. And it happens, they call it the red zone, which in the first, uh, I believe it's the first four to eight weeks of, uh, or first week to the eight weeks of class that you're in, you're more likely to be sexually assaulted. And if you're in a sorority, you're three times more likely to be sexually assaulted. And if you are um, in a frat, frat boys are three times more likely to rape. So um, you're dealing with all these things that no one tells you. They just tell you, go off and have a good time. And so you think you should, and you will. And we don't prepare students for what what lies on the other side especially in this environment where there's a renewed white supremacy movement and um, there's alt-right flyers ha um, posted on campuses alt-right events happening on campuses um, we don't prepare students for that um, thank you for mentioning that it sort of feels um, especially now as these things are kicking up they're intensifying they're always there but I find that they're intensifying mm -hmm. and we're allowing it to intensify with what's going on and the kinds of discourse that's happening if we put young people in these situations and they get harmed, they get hurt, they experience microaggressions, I think we all share a responsibility for what that is. Um, and I think we share a responsibility for um, the environments that we thrust them into and necess don't necessarily give them the support they need. That was so abundantly clear in your book, um, just how we have to take it on and not see it as, oh, well, it's just a space and they're gonna go and do their own thing. Like it's a microcosm. Tell us a yeah. little bit about that idea. You mentioned it in your book about how the campus space can be a microcosm in many ways. Yeah, well, you know, that's twofold. It's the idea that, um, well, just grow up and deal with it, right? Like someone called you a name, you deal with it. And um, not realizing that uh, when you look at, or when I was research, re researching this book, what I found was kind of shocking. We're, we're telling these young people that they're, or what we call millennials, and the, the term millennials is quite negative. They're lazy, they're self-indulgent, they like avocado toast, they're ruining everything. But women, in, um, intimate partner violence, it most affects young women. Black and brown men are disproportionately carded. Um, cyber stalking, cyber bullying, it, it, 
the there are more people in this age group who are um, experiencing cyberbullying and harassment. Um, there are all these issues happening. Mental health, sir, the the need for mental health services is skyrocketing. Students are getting degrees in the shaky environment, economic environment, and not being able to afford a house. Might not ever be able to afford a house um, or property. And um, this era that's just the the generations that's just behind me. Um, they grew up in an environment of school shootings. So how can we say that, you know, you're just being entitled and lazy and whiny? So I think in that sense, um, this microcosm of, of university has, has been, well, you're here to have fun, but you're also here to learn. And what you learn here is, is this is where you can make the mistakes. This is where there's an exchange of, of ideas. Um, and we allow that. It's the, this, this kind of cushion between like fantasy world and the real world where you can make decisions. But what's happening is the decisions um, being made, the conversations happening, the actions, the behaviors, the gestures, and the silence that are happening in this little space where you can make mistakes, it's actually causing a lot of damage, harm, and trauma to other students, marginalized students. And an example that I use is in the book when I talk about um, blackface parties and how blackface parties, they actually have been, um, they're, they're fairly new or have resurged in 15 years, the last 10, 15 years in Canada. And a lot of times universities will say, well, it didn't happen on our campus, so we're not gonna hold anyone accountable, or we don't wanna ruin someone's life by suspending them. If you read those, um, the news reports on those, these students are often never suspended. They just get a slap on the wrist or um, the pro-rape chants that happen um, during Frosh Week across Canada. Students get a slap on the wrist. And what that says is that we don't wanna, these perpetrators, are allowed to continue, but then we've inflicted this harm on these other students who are now unable, um, they internalize that. And then what happens is you end up someone like me who doesn't realize how much of this trauma I've carried with me um, as an adult. So um, it is this place to make mistakes and you know be young and youthful, but we, we never like to see what the, the consequences of those things are. Um, I think you so beautifully bring out the fact that, yes, you internalize the things that happen to you that are negative, but you also internalize the response to them as well, or the lack thereof of a response. So how, how powerful. Um, and you speak about these moments of being in limbo, this idea of having to balance emotions, being nervous as being seen as too angry, maybe when somebody says something ignorant to you, something racist to you, and killing the vibe, especially in like a bar context, a party context. Tell us more about that impossible situation and what needs to happen to stop putting people harmed by racism in that position. Yeah, it is an impossible situation. Um, I remember just kind of getting excited about something just because that's how I am. But when I'm, when I'm comfortable with people, I'm, you know, I'm loud and chatty. And I remember being this, this white guy being like, whoa, 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 Shanika, calm down. You're getting mad. And I was just excited. And it, 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 it stung in this way that was, it was kind of sad because I had just gone to a place where I trusted people um, enough or trusted myself to be myself around other people. And then I was being called Shaniqua, like, take it easy. Um, and it's you you just can't win and um you can't win because one you're the only sometimes you're the only person who looks like you in a space or you're the only black person out of all of your friends and your friends can try to be friends for you or be allies but there's always there always seems to be that kind of slip up and for me i i had wonderful friends um who weren't black um that i would go to parties with and then i think everything's good and then they're like hey can we use the n-word like is it okay and you're like, oh my gosh, what do I do? If I say no, I'll never get invited to a party. I won't have friends. Um, they'll think I'm militant. But if I say yes, then it mm -hmm. it affects me. I feel I feel weird. I feel uncomfortable. Um, and so you just can't win. And I think um, one thing that we we can do, which is not the best thing to do, but it's obviously to read, to educate ourselves. And a lot of times when I do anti-racism training, I talk about this chart, which is like an allyship chart. And um, we start at one and we, start, we go to six. Six is the best ally. When you are um, educating yourself, you're still not there. You have to educate yourself. You have to interrupt your own behavior and other people's behavior. And then you have to educate them and you have to consistently do the work. If you mess up, that doesn't matter. You apologize, you consistently, genuinely do the work. And um, I believe her name is Shri At 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 Atchison. Um, she said that 
if you think you're an ally, you are not an ally until the group that you want to ally with sees you as an ally. And I thought that was really interesting because I think that we all have friends who um, they say they have our backs or they pat themselves on the shoulder for being an ally. But then when you look at what's actually happening, they may not be. So I think we all need need to be doing better um, to be able to to be the best ally that we say that we are. That one to six kind of the, the degrees of allyship, is that part of the anti-racism training that you did on campus this year? That, um, I did talk about it. Yes, I, I talked a little bit about that, um, the anti-race, the, the gradient of allyship uh, when I was at Western in uh, early September. So I'd spoken to about nine, um, I think there were about 900 watching. They were first year student advisors. Um, they were mandated to read the book, which was really great. So um, we talked about just what it means to the tremendous power that students actually have to influence other students. Because as student leaders, um, student leaders are watching over first years, they're handling problems. And so we talked about what does it mean if you're, you know, if you're an ally, but you have one student of color on your floor, what happens if something happens there? What do we do? So um, I had a, a, about a uh, half an hour talk with them about um, you know, the ways to be a great student leader, but also be a great student to other students. I love that they had to read the book. That is so powerful. Um, I do wonder if you feel, I noticed that there's a lot of trainings now and a lot of people asking, we need a diversity consultant and all this, this stuff. Lots of, of fervor. And I think there's a lot of good stuff about that. But I do wonder how, what would you think needs to happen for these to not just be a moment in time, for these uh, not to just get shelved, you know, I'm like, okay, I did that check. And how it can kind of turn more into meaningful change or be the start point for more changes down the road. Yeah, I think um, when when I'm approached or I hear about a training that's happened and there's one or two, I normally feel like that's a, a saving face thing, if, especially if there's no follow up. Um, we can't solve all, we're not trying to solve everything. We're not trying to solve the problem of racism, but we are trying to educate and hold people accountable. And we can't do that in one session or even two. We can't do that in three sessions. Um, and so I think it's great that we're doing this, but I also, has, we've all seen this happen before. We saw this happen in 2014 when Black Lives Matter um, became global. We've seen it in the years since. We've had several of these movements over and over again. Um, this time, I think that the reason it's it's lasted this long is because it's not just about it's not just about George Floyd, um, but it's also we have COVID and we're seeing the ways in which COVID is disproportionately affecting Black people. There's so many things going on. But um, what I would like to see is that if we're doing this training, in terms of, if we're talking about training, I'd like to see um, check-ins. I'd like there to be some you know, actual policies created and then having to report those policies and that, that those results um, and those follow-ups to somebody. And um, if we're talking about hiring, I'm very much against hiring people, hiring black and or or other people of color for the sake of hiring because it just puts a band-aid on the issue and so if the top needs to change but we're not making room for other senior positions or we're not fixing those things and I think a lot of people at the top they're afraid or there's egos involved where they don't want to admit that they have work to do if we're not going to fix that we still shouldn't be hiring other people of color we're bringing them into a situation where we're causing more harm so I think that there needs to be room at the top on a senior level but we can't be bringing in people of color um, to fill contract positions for a little bit of money and then just to save face and then have them leave a year later uh, because it doesn't really do a whole lot. So these there needs to be a complete almost dismantling of the ways that we operate as um, not just society, but in terms of, of work um, and structures and institutions, because right now it feels a whole lot like we're putting band-aids on situations. Um, thank you for that. I think that structural change too, I, I sometimes wonder, why aren't we talking more about financial incentives um, that, you know, if you, you don't do X, Y, and Z, you don't see these changes, that there are maybe some financial consequences to that. Sometimes I feel that thing, that financial lens really works, especially in the private sector and in sectors where, um, you know, you're looking at the bottom line. Well, okay, that bottom line is hurt when you hurt people. Um, I really appreciated the fact that your book talked about how the experience of gender-based violence really does impact your ability to learn. 
And it reminded me of a book that I read a long time ago called Too Scared to Learn, Women, Violence and Education by Jenny Horseman. It was um, looking at some of the kind of um, mental health effects, the um, brain effects that trauma has on you and how that can make it difficult for you to pursue education and in a degree. Tell us more about what you explore when it comes to gender-based violence in this book and particularly the impacts on young women in post-secondary learning. So um, one of my chapters is about my own experience with intimate partner violence. And I tie that to some of the research that I actually did for my thesis when I was a master's of journalism student. And um, it was really interesting to, to learn what I did about violence and young women, especially of university age. Um, but women 50 to 24 are the most at risk of intimate partner violence in the country. And it's not just Canada, it's also in the US. But we don't hear about that very very seldom um it's very seldom that we hear about that but we do hear about domestic violence and domestic violence it implies a lot of things it implies domestic being home it, it implies that it's women who are often older or cohabitating women with children uh, when we see domestic violence services they often involve shelters and shelters tend to cater or their their advertising tends to cater to women with children which we often assume are married women um, and then when we look at the programs involved, we have dating violence programs in high schools, for example, that go up to 18, and then we have domestic violence services for older women, but nothing was happening in this age group of, of um, you know, university years. So what I had set out to do was understand why this was happening, why we were in the situation, what the factor, how the factors were different, and what I had found through talking to professors, talking to students, actually speaking to friends of mine who at the time were going through the exact same issues as I was um, with intimate partner violence, but we weren't talking about it to each other, and, and speaking to experts was that um, there are several reasons. The first is that we are away from home for the first time in many cases, or this is the, this is the rite of passage in terms of adulthood. So we think that if something happens to us, we shouldn't be telling our parents, we should handle it ourselves. We are, I found a lot of women who were like very, um, you know, very, um, educated into you know women's studies majors or minors they understood how abuse worked but they they couldn't see it in their own relationship so they were saying well he like he spat on me and but he didn't hit me so I think that's okay so they we weren't seeing this up uh, this application in the same way um, young women are they grew up in this era of casual dating and hookup culture this generation is more uh, gender fluid than other generations. So our casual relationships, whether they're poly or we're just casually dating, um, whether we are gender queer, gender fluid, queer, trans, we may not feel comfortable going to report it to police because we feel that we're, we don't fall under the rigid stereotype or the rigid category of partnership, which when you look at Statistics Canada, there are definitions of partnerships and those don't fall under them. Um, and we also, we our, our peers don't know any better. The people that were around, they also don't really know that much better. That's what the research shows, that they're not as educated either. So there are all these factors. Um, at the same time, we're being cyber stalked at record rates, cyber harassed, um, blackmailed. Um, there's revenge porn laws have, have shown up in this, it was this generation. Um, but yet no one is funding this generation. And so what happens then is that when we grow up or when you become an adult or you graduate, because we don't have the preventative measures in place like we did for teenagers and older women, this generation continues to have these relationships well into their 30s, 40s, and 50s. And so we need the work to be done. We need the funding. We need the research. And what's so ironic about all of this is that universities do a lot of research. They are funded to do research on domestic violence, but they very rarely do that research on within their own age demographic. Uh, what a fantastic observation. I think uh, more and more people are talking about this idea of what we measure, we believe in. What we measure, we take action on. What we don't measure, we don't even know exists or we are enabled 
to ignore. So um, I think you're really speaking to this idea. And it's a kind of ironic that in these research based institutions that that's missing. Um, so you do speak about this idea of experiencing dating violence in your high school years and then it coming following you into your um, post secondary years. I thought about a better man, uh, Atia Khan. Uh, she had a film about this issue and she had that very same experience. It just struck me, high school student moving to post-secondary, um, having all the dynamics that you spoke about and finding herself um, needing to kind of be in that middle space of discovering yourself and yet trying to deal with this, this factor pulling you back, pulling you down. I just wonder what you think, what high schools and post-secondary institutions can do better, particularly for BIPOC youth. Atia as well spoke to that idea of um, being really harmed and harassed by her partner um, and him calling her racist names and making her feel like nobody would love you and all this awful, awful stuff. So I want to know what you think these institutions, high schools and post-secondary can do for particularly BIPOC youth. Yeah, I've, uh, I've seen A Better Man and I I saw it because I was so drawn to it because of my own experience. I was like, my goodness, this is, you know, you don't think that other people have that experience. Um, and I think for me, I was very ashamed up until kind of you know, years later, because I was teaching students about dating violence. So I had the resources in my hand. Like I was, go I was giving the presentations to grade nines and grade tens to at risk students. I was telling them, if someone does this to you, this is a red flag. I knew exactly what the red flags were, but you just don't think it's something that can happen to you um, ever. You think that by some grace of God, you've, you are, you did well in all your assignments. So it's not going to happen to you or you are a good person. So it's not going to happen to you. And it does. And you're in denial. You're a teenager. You're in complete denial. Um, and so in terms of what universe, what, um, po secondary education, well, secondary schools can do, I, I'm not sure. I I think one thing is the the conversations that happen in class. They they enable violence against women. And like I say in the book, at the time, the the only example I had was what had happened between Chris Brown and Rihanna, and um, all the students who were talking about it, they would always blame her. She had done something to deserve it. And as we know, that was a vicious assault, and no one deserves that. But students would talk about it, and teachers would walk by and we'd talk about it in class and no one ever addressed it. And so I thought, well, I guess I should go along with it. I guess I should assume that something, you know, this woman deserved it, even though I might, you know, no one's here to tell me that she didn't deserve it. And then I grew up thinking I deserved it. So there's, there are a lot of conversations. I think a lot of teachers are afraid of looking uncool in front of students or they're afraid to have mm -hmm. these conversations. I went to a Catholic school. We didn't even talk about teen pregnancy, even though we had pregnant teenagers. So there are schools that have initiatives where you're talking about dating violence. Um, and we had a school counselor. So I'm not sure what the, the gap is, but I think it's starting with, if you hear those things, training teachers, if you hear them, or, you know, if you're able to approach students, if you know something is going on, that's a good way at least of um, um, being in the room, in the classroom and trying to stop these things from happening or these conversations from going forward. Um, you really beautifully speak to this difference between like what you might know uh, in an academic way or in a um, kind of, you know, the statistics and the warning signs, but what you do and what you believe can um, be very different. And you just made me remember a time in my um, early 20s when I was doing uh, violence prevention work and um, somebody told me they were in a violent relationship. And it was more like of a personal dynamic. We weren't in a workshop. And I remember asking an awful question to them that was based in a myth. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what I said. I didn't say particularly, what did you do to deserve it? I said more like, um, how hard did they hit you? They didn't hit you that hard, did they? Mm -hmm. And I shocked myself. I totally shocked myself. I said, where did that come from? Where in the world would I ever ask such an awful question? And I think it's this idea that... Uh, you know, your your second answer is the answer that you want to say, but the first answer really represents what you learned. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I am, um, and on, on top of all these things, on top of having all of the, the resources, I was very close uh, with the school youth worker. I consider her a second mother. 
And I wouldn't have even, I had told her about some of the stuff. I had told her about his behavior. We had talked about it. And then after we had broken up, I had gone to go see her. So I was, I was at Western. I traveled from London to Toronto to come see her. And she wouldn't even make the time for me. And she was ignoring me. And I went to go talk to her. And she said something along the lines of like, oh, I heard what happened. The whole school is talking about it. But it wasn't what I thought it was. She hadn't heard that he had assaulted me. She heard from him that I had cheated on him. And that was what was going around. And I thought, you're my youth worker. You've been through this. You know me. You know the situation. And you're telling me that everyone's gossiping about me, which is not helping with mental health. But um, it's also, yes, even us the, us who know better, we still have these slip-ups or we still have these, these notions or preconceived notions of what things are um, that we let slip sometimes. Um, that is so, so painful. And I just wonder your thoughts around, especially adults, um, when we have not just parents and guardians and teachers, but even people who are neighbors and friends who are like aunties, who might be really important to us in our lives. Um, I wanna know what you feel that we can do when we're around the young people in our lives, particularly the young women or the trans youth or the two-spirit youth that we're around. What can we do to help build up this, this positive dynamic, knowing that people very much are in these binds and we may not even hear about it until perhaps years later, if at all. There's a, yeah, there's a few things. You said aunties because I am you know, South Asian. And um, one thing I think that for certain cultures we, we do wrong is uh, we criticize in the name of love or affection. Um, saying, oh, you got fat. You look kind of fat today. Uh, your face got fat. Or even if it's something as like, there's a relationship that's going kind of south and it's a young person you say, well, you don't have kids with them. Just leave them. Just break up with them. This dis dismissing um, young people and what they're going through, I think it causes, I think it creates a lot of further harm and confusion for young people. So I think that taking time um, to understand young people. And I think we just assume that young, like young folks are, um, you know, they're whiny, they're, they're self-indulgent, they're lazy, they don't know what they're talking about, they're kids. And I, I don't think I've ever, um, knowing that I've been through that and knowing what I was going through even at that age, I've never looked at a teenager and said, oh, they're just a teenager. What they're going through is valid. And I don't think we validate um, the emotions and the feelings and the concerns of teenagers. And when we don't do that, when instead we say, oh, you got fat or you look sad and miserable, um, then they don't want to talk to us and they don't want to communicate and they learn not to trust us. So I think we can all be a lot kinder. And um, when I was writing my memoir, one thing that really has stuck with me was that even within my family, people would say, like, you're young. Why would you write a memoir? Like, you don't, you haven't suffered enough yet. You haven't been long enough, you haven't been alive long enough on this earth to have suffered. And meanwhile, I'm suffering. So, um, I think as grown-ups, we have a lot of work to do, a lot of um, unlearning to do when it even comes to just youth and what they're experiencing. Um, and we need to hold ourselves accountable for the ways that we've been dismissive um, and made it so that young people can't come and speak to us. And that especially applies doubly if you're part of the LGBTQ2S community, um, which in in that sense, a lot of relationships, a lot of cyber stalking, a lot of intimate partner violence, it affects the, um, the LGBTQ2S community more so than heterosexual or cis heterosexual couples. Um, so yeah, we have we don't want to admit that when we're wrong as adults, we don't want to admit um, you know we're wrong to teenagers, but that's what it's going to take so that we can start to have these conversations and keep young people safe. Thank you for that insight. Uh, we we have this campaign going on right now. It just struck me. Show up for girls. Um, Eternity just gave us some wonderful ideas of how we can show up for girls if we're adults. Um, and let's just think about what she said, you know, this idea of not leading with criticism, leading with things that make people kind of un not trust us or kind of feel um, tender around us because they don't feel that we're there for them or we're scrutinizing them in a negative way. And uh, particularly what you said around uh, 2S LGBTQI communities and um, how subject to crying eyes and awful comments and awful thoughts um, that they have to deal with all the time um, for us to be kind and tender and to maybe listen and be a little bit more humble in our approach would really help a lot. I have seen some questions here. I want to get to them because some of them are just so beautiful. Um, I, I see what somebody is asking here about the signs, teaching the skills, 
um, of an abusive relationship. That strikes uh, Keitha, who said this, as so important. Can you tell us a little bit more about the shame around knowing those signs, teaching the skills, and being in an abusive relationship? Yeah, it's something that um, I've actively had to say to myself several times, um, like, it's it's you need to forgive yourself for, for feeling shame like the shame is so great that I could um try to save the lives of other young girls and um at that time you know you're you're in high school so you're older and you think you're cool thinking that I'm above them somehow and then being the one who who needed that I needed someone to tell me that even though I had those skills um and so I spent a lot of time, and and ironically, of all the topics, we talked about substance abuse, we talked about um, drunk driving, dating violence was the thing I was most interested in. And the way that I asked young girls to show up for themselves in ways, whether it's they their boyfriend disrespected them, their partner disrespected them or said something, um, I wasn't showing up for myself in that way. And I didn't learn how to show up to, for myself in that way until I had graduated Western. So um, it's a really tricky situation. And it's something that even in my book, I didn't want to talk about like knowing the signs, but I thought it was incredibly important because I think that um, in the work that I've done, every single woman I spoke to knew the signs or had been through it and the the violence had started and it builds. I think it's called um, you know, like the, the frog in the, in the frying pan. And um, we all knew it. We we knew the signs. We knew the emotional abuse. You get isolated from your friends. Um, they're making comments about you. Suddenly, you can't talk to guys. Your your shorts are too short. Next thing you know, um, you know a door is getting slammed in your face, and then it's your face. So we knew all of them. We just, but that's why it was important for me to talk about it in the book, even though it didn't want it didn't want to, because if I could let other people know that it's okay, and this is a common thing, I think that was better than keeping the shame to myself. Um, and folks, if you didn't get the chance to see this book, this is what it looks like. You can get it in uh, paper and you can get it also um, on audio format as well in e-format. And I just want to uh, close on this great question here. Somebody has asked about, well, you've drawn a lot of inspiration from feminist thinkers and writers. And this person is asking one or two of the pieces that you tend to return to again and again. Can you tell us a bit about those? Yes, this is one of my favorite questions. Um, I feminist texts and black feminist scholars are one of the ma the biggest reasons why I got through Western because I was able to see my own experience there. So definitely bell hooks eating the other desire and resistance. So that's a chapter from her book called black looks and representation, where she talks about um, the ways that black women are being used as racial novelties by men. Um, and other women of color, it's brilliant. I use it all the time. And um, the uses of anger by Audre Lorde mm -hmm. is brilliant. Um, it was a keynote, but um, she talks about the ways that anger for women of color is so transformative and healing. And how when we come together, anger is seen when you're a black woman, your anger is dismissed, you're seen as entitled, you're seen as dangerous. What she talks about is how our anger is different than white people's anger, for example, where white people's anger against other people of color is meant to harm people. Our anger is grief because we're fed up of being treated like, like an other. Um, and so she talks about the importance of, of um, anger, collective anger, to heal and transform and change the world. So I return to those two over and over and over again. Um, Angela Davis, love her, Barbara Smith, like there's just so, so many. And they're like, they're like a warm blanket. I don't know how many people read feminist texts for comfort, but I do and it, it comforts me a lot. Thanks. Um, I find that the comfort and the also the putting the lens back on, it's sometimes it's so stark. I sometimes forget that um, you know, I'll, I'll go through stuff or I'll uh, see things and I'll be like, this is so confusing. And it's just so stark when you read the uses of anger, for instance, you're like, yes, yes, that's what I remember. That's, that's what I know. So thank you very much for that. Is there anything else that you would like to share with us before we close up with you? Um, no, I think it's great. Um, we have a lot of work to do and it's work that we haven't really dug into. Um, and we all play a role in it. We all have a small role to play or a big role to play. So, um, yeah, I just I'm hopeful for the future and um, and thank you for having me. Thank you for this discussion.
Eternity, thank you so much. You've been very kind to us. And for folks who didn't know, Eternity also did a piece with us before for folks who joined our, our book club um, environment. So uh, thank you very much for joining us and, and just being so generous with your time and with your words. Of course. Thank you. So we are just going to close up right now. And I wanted to just thank Eternity again for her beautiful book. Uh, I think really uh, reading this was very healing to me in many ways. Um, and I think for a lot of people, what they found is that it spoke to their experiences a long time ago, perhaps some of us who haven't been in, in university and college for many moves, but we remember how difficult it was. And sometimes that hasn't been validated. And I just found it such a validating book for that reason. So um, I really encourage you to pick it up and support your local bookstore um, and support Eternity for, for what she's doing. She's really awesome. And uh, we, we appreciate her voice, especially nowadays, um, getting stronger and stronger. And, you know, we're really focused on the impact of COVID-19, particularly on young women and girls. Um, I'm just so cognizant of the fact that almost every day we're asked questions about what's the impact on women? What's the gendered impact? Um, but sometimes I think that girls is a bit of um, a gap in terms of our understanding and in terms of what we think we need to do. So really, we're focusing on this in particular when it comes to the mental health of girls um, and not just the mental health, but also how economic instability impacts young women um, and how as well the risk of violence increasing would also increase risks for young women. And the programs like the ones that the Canadian Women Support, uh, Women's Foundation supports really helps girls find belonging, community and mentorship. But of course, they're operating in a very different dynamic right now, and it's more difficult for them to provide the services and be there and stay open for young women. So I'd like to encourage you to show up for girls in October, and we still have a little bit of October left. Um, every dollar you donate to our girls fund will turn into three thanks to Sinking Ship Entertainment and Giant Tiger, our two partners. So please go to our website if you'd like to learn more about that campaign, uh, CanadianWomen.org, show up for girls. And if you are able to give at this time, we'd appreciate anything. You know, $1 turns into three. So if you've got $1, there's three right there. We really appreciate for uh, all your support. And um, there's been so many people who have been so kind and generous to the programs that we serve all around the country. So I just want to thank you for that. I'd also like to just uh, give you a heads up about a couple of things going on in the next little while. We have another reading event. Um, we have this uh, on, oh, let me just get rid of that banner so you can see it, November the 23rd with Sherry Lapina. And uh, she wrote uh, a number of books, but this one that we're gonna focus on is called The End of Her. And you can go to our Tireless Readers Collective page to um, actually sign up right away to get to the meeting grade and get a copy of her book as part of that. And we also have Jessica J. Lee on December the 11th. Um, she has this great memoir called Two Trees Make a Forest, and we'll be speaking to her about this. Really excited about both of these events. Uh, go to our website for uh, more information about that and to sign up. Uh, it's ready for you to go sign up, get your ticket now, um, and you'll get it in advance so you'll be able to read it. And I just want to, again, thank you for joining us. And I want to leave you with this one video. Uh, we're really, again, focused on the impact of the pandemic on girls. So we hope that you will join us and think about the ways that you can show up for girls this October. Have a great rest of the day. Hey, my name is Sara Chaudhry, and I play Nira on lockdown. This October, we're partnering with the Canadian Women's Foundation to show up for girls. The impact of COVID-19 on girls' mental health is deepening. And girl-focused programs that help girls find belonging, community, and mentorship are struggling to stay open. We need to act now to make sure that girls in Canada, of all backgrounds and identities, get the support they need. Join us this October to show up for girls. Every dollar you give to girls' programs at CanadianWomen.org will be tripled up to $20,000 thanks to Sinking Ship Entertainment and Giant Tiger. And we want you to share how you're showing up for girls in your life. Whether you're a parent, guardian, family member, an educator, mentor, or friend. Share your stories and inspiration using the hashtag showupforgirls. It's more important than ever. So let's get all of Canada to, to show, show up for girls. girls.